Welcome to everybody from as far away as Mexico to as close to us as uh, Montana, just north of us in uh, Montana and Glasgow. So uh, quick quick intro for, for today. Um, this is our forecast event. Uh, we will be doing this tonight live in Billings, and then we'll be doing it next Tuesday live in Gillette. Uh, we try to do these every six months. When COVID hit, we added this Zoom call. It seemed to have enough of you on it that aren't either here in Billings or in Gillette or couldn't make it or don't live here and are somewhere else in the country, which we have lots of you. So thanks for your time and effort. We'll spend about 40 to 45 minutes. If there's some real specific Q&A, you can always email Ryan or call Ryan or I, uh, email me whenever you want. You don't have to wait for these Zoom calls. But if there's something you think maybe the group would benefit from, um, I think at the end we'll have a, a, an ability for you to ask a question by raising your hand or or uh, or whatnot. So as far as intro to the team, you guys, uh, at least on my screen at the top, you might see a name, Kalen Shea. Kalen's new to our team. Kalen, if you want to wave, he's a uh, He's new to our team as of May of last year. Excited to have him. Just finished all of his CPA exams. Took his FINRA exams. I think I saw him studying for some insurance exams here recently. So lots of exams to pass in our industry to get to where you want to go. So uh, excited for all, all of you to meet him. Uh, next on my screen is McKinsey and Jill. She's sitting with her mom. You guys all know the spicy redhead Jill. That's her, unfortunately for her, the oldest daughter she has. So she's had to live with Jill a lot longer than any of us. I say that I babysit Jill during the day and her husband babysits her at night. So, um, And then who's not with us today is Hope. Hope is on vacation with her husband. He's working and she's enjoying some time to herself without her five children. So much needed for her. Um, Ryan, if you want to go back to, to – and then you guys all know Ryan. He's the one who's been chatting. I, don't, I think he, he doesn't much need introduction any long, longer. He'll be sharing uh, the mic with me today. Um, so again, thanks for being here, Forecast 2022. Um, we will talk Russia-Ukraine, I promise. It's just not right at the start, but we will get into it, I promise. Um, we can't get through these without right, the attorney writes this slide. These are our opinions, and this is general information, not you know for you to take our, our advice to go apply to a portfolio. Right? Kind of the layout for today, we're going to talk economy, where we're at, financial markets, what may be ahead, which is where I discuss – Russia and uh, Ukraine. And then a part we added on our own, which we called what matters most. And Ryan will finish that. And I, I do think that's a really critical part of today's agenda. Okay. So, you know, the term, we're going to start with a, a quiz here, uh, just warming up. We typically do that. I thought some of these were pretty interesting, kind of uh, the 2021 COVID theme type stuff, but a customer in North Carolina liked a certain type of cuisine so much they ordered for the same restaurant 904 times, which is crazy. That's 2.4 times a day. What type of cuisine was it? I thought Mexican. It actually is the Indian food. So I don't know if any of you guys ordered 904 times from the same restaurant in 2020, 2021, but if you did, you probably got a problem. All right, this one, I love this one. Customers sometimes had odd requests when it came to food. Which of the following food combinations was not actually requested? So three of the four of these people actually ordered, right? And uh, I just saw a video the other day. My kids put it up there. and The mom was like so tired of parenting her children. She says, you can eat whatever you can make. And the little boy made a hot dog with like melted uh, chocolate chips on it. So I, I, that's not something I would have done, but this falls in that category. So the one that actually wasn't ordered is French fries and hot fudge, but like people ordered pizza and sauerkraut, people ordered ice cream and hot sauce, people ordered watermelon and yellow mustard. So French fries and hot fudge, maybe that's on the, t the ticket. Um, this one's not so much a joke, more so just kind of like, can you believe that happened? It feels like a long time ago because it's almost a year, but what was the name of the canal where the ship uh, blocked global trade, right? Does anybody know that one? Suez Canal, right? Suez Canal. Of course, the middle, the middle little uh, picture there is my favorite. It says, my ambitious plan to free the boat is to push a huge cotton swab up the canal. So if you could see the screen, that's, that's, that's part of the reason this one made it. But yeah, this just, why did we include that one? If you click the next slide, Brian, that's supply chain right there, right? I always say it's not complex. It's just complicated, right? It's not complex. It's just complicated, right? Why is it complicated? Because when one of those things stuffs a new canal, stuff doesn't get everywhere, right? Um, all right, so the economy, I'll let Ryan jump in here for a little bit. I think, uh, Ryan, 
The yeah. floor is yours, bud. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, thanks for tuning in. We we love getting a chance to get in front of you, especially just in seasons like this. The market hasn't been a ton of fun, um, but it's it's so great for us to just get in front of you and communicate what we're seeing, what's going on. And so, thanks for giving us an hour here. So, looking back on the economy, you know, kind of what did we see through last year? Um, you know, since March 2020, I'd say even since February 2020, we've really been focused on COVID and we're starting to maybe get away from it, but then we have this Ukraine, Russia stuff. So again, we'll touch on it, but the beginning of this, we're really looking back on just what did we see and activity was almost back to normal. And, and when we talk about activity, the main thing we're talking about is services. Okay. So this is people going to restaurants. This is cafes, shopping centers, theme parks, kind of think of traveling. And so we really were getting to the point where we were actually seeing numbers a little bit bigger than even pre COVID levels. Now durable goods, which would, I would call it like your home depots, um, targets, Walmarts, things that aren't necessarily services. Those obviously, obviously exploded coming out of COVID and it was kind of the pandemic buys, but it's the service side of the industry that we're really seeing the levels get back to where we were, but we've had a few disruptions in there. When we look at overall U.S. economic growth last year, the annualized number came in at about 6.4%. Okay, and when you're talking a 22 to $23 trillion economy, and that's GDP, which is all the goods and services that we as a country produce. When you grow 6.4%, that is a big, big number, okay? But we were still coming off kind of the, the hills of COVID. And so as you see on this chart, kind of towards the right, you see there right in 2020 where we just had a massive drop, something we didn't even think was possible. But then we had a V-shaped recovery. And, and we've really stayed in that same trajectory especially as we got the second and third round of stimulus. And so that's part of why we saw that 6.4% growth. Um, I, I don't think there's any way we maintain that. And, and quite frankly, I don't know if that's a great thing if we maintain it, because that's also why we're seeing so much inflation right now. And, and we'll get to that in a minute. But again, a, a great year in 2021 for just overall U.S. economic growth. Companies were growing. The economy was growing. Hey Ryan, will you do me a favor? I think yes. that radio is on just slightly. Like it's, I still hear a little. I don't know. Oh, if that's that's, yeah, I yeah. maybe it's just because. So just yeah, make perfect. sure it gets all the way turned off. Thanks. Yep. Yeah. Thanks. Um. So as as we talked about it, we did have some disruptions. As you look back into kind of July summertime frame, we really saw the Delta variant kind of spreading throughout the world, and and that created more supply chain issues. And as we've talked about before, as we came out of COVID, we. We shut down so much of the world and supply chains got really gooped up. Plus, we didn't know what demand was going to be on the backside of COVID. People thought this was the end of small businesses. They didn't think we could ever recover and get back to the numbers we were at. So suppliers and supply chains didn't even know, well, how much should we be producing? They stopped. And then there's this massive explosive demand. And ever since then, our supply chains have been trying to play catch up. And then it's been slowed by the Delta variant. And then most recently, kind of late December, early January, I feel like everybody I knew that had kids had Omicron, meaning everybody we knew. And so I think we saw a little bit of a slowdown kind of late December, early January, but it was really, really fast. And I think we're already seeing things back to normal, but this has continued to put a little bit of disruption on our supply chains, which is a, a big leader in just what we're seeing with inflation. Looking at employment, Overall, we had a 4.2% unemployment rate, which is really, really good. And, and when we look at it, I think we've had lower numbers kind of through the Trump eras where I think we were in the three high 3.9, 3.8%. But when we look at the jobs that are open compared to where we're at with unemployment, we are in total employment, meaning anybody that wants a job right now can have a job. You just have people out there that are looking for the right job or they don't want to go back to work. And that's where that 4.2% number comes in. You know, I think most states have learned that we can't have such good economic incentives to keep people on unemployment. Um, like we saw through COVID, again, there was a time and a place for that for the first few months. And some states tried to extend that. And those states were really, really hurting. Whereas the states that forced everybody to go back to work 
Florida, Montana, Wyoming being those type of states, they have a very, very healthy economy right now, which is good to see. And then most of the states across the U.S. are, are also at that place. So good. Unemployment numbers look really strong, um, but it is leading to some issues. This is a great quote. Um, from Marion Flynn, just somebody that we follow. She talks about that even before the pandemic, we faced an endemic shortage of workers to fill in demand middle skill jobs. Okay, which a middle skill job we talk about a plumber, electrician, they don't maybe need a formal four years of school, um, but they still need a little bit of education and they're very, very important to our economy. And we had a shortage kind of heading into COVID and now we have even a bigger shortage and so what this is leading to is where it's pushing the wages higher for lots of different labor companies and industries out there. And this is also tying into inflation. So again, we, we had a little bit of an issue pre-COVID. COVID, COVID kind of amplified it a little bit more. And this is something that we have to continue to look for. I know when Gabe and I talked to some of our business owning clients, the top concern they have is just finding good employees right now. So as we look at that, we also have seen higher earnings um, kind of tying into this idea of inflation. And we've told you that short term markets don't like They just don't like inflation. And the biggest reason why that is, is because, yes, we have higher earnings on everything, but then we also have higher costs everywhere in there because we got to pay more for services. we got to pay more for employees. we got to pay more for goods if we're in that type of business. And so even if profits up here, our costs are going up. And so it shrinks the overall profit for that company. Okay, so how do companies deal with that? They raise prices. And so if you look at Amazon's earnings here, they just smashed expectations two weeks ago. But then as they talked about, yes, our earnings were really, really good, but we also are noticing that the cost for everything we're doing, warehouse costs, employees are going up what stocks or what companies end up doing is they pass that expense on to you and I and they raise the prices. And so Amazon went from 119 bucks a year for Amazon Prime to I think 138 or 139 bucks. So almost a $20 increase for everyone that's part of Amazon Prime. And that's a great example of what happens with stocks with inflation is short term, it's very, very volatile because yes, earnings look good, but then so do all the costs and, and expenses. So profits shrink. And the only way that they can combat that is they raise the price and pass it on to you and I as the consumer, which is what we're all feeling with inflation right now. Again, long term stocks do, do better um, as well as real estate do better in high inflationary times, but they got to get through this mess of figuring it out. Of course, we've all seen kind of just this supply chain issues. Um, again, this is tying into our inflation numbers. I still see this, you know, whether you go to the Home Depots, um, Costco's, lots of different places are still having issues as we're playing catch up from COVID and then these kind of rolling shutdowns. But we are starting to see some really, really positive signs there. Um, again, somebody that we follow here with the IHS market, worldwide supplier delays moderated big time in November. We might see a little bit of a pause again in late December, early January because of Omicron, but we're really seeing around the world where that Delta surge of this summer, especially in Asia, Asia, where a lot of our supply chains are tied up, are really back on track and are doing a good job, which is getting the supply side to where we need it, which Gabe and I would argue is one of the most important things as we look at inflation right now. So looking at actual inflationary numbers here, Look to the right on the chart here, um, you know, very, very high numbers. We were seeing six, 7% in inflation, the highest that we've felt in 40 years and seen in 40 years. Now with oil, uh, you don't traditionally see energy and food in, in one of these indices as you look at it, kind of the lighter blue one. And so we felt inflation before, especially when oil has gone up. But across the board like this, we haven't seen this type of inflation in almost 40 years, which is what everybody worried about when we printed kind of that third round of stimulus. And then we knew we had supply chains as we created this perfect recipe for inflation to happen. We've been trying, quite frankly, the Fed had been trying for 15 years to get a little bit of inflation, but we finally created the right recipe where we have very, very high inflation and we got to get it figured out. 
Ryan, if you wouldn't mind going back there, I want to say one thing yeah, on that yeah. slide that you brought that you brought up. So, guys, I don't care if it's inflation. I don't care if it's the price of a barrel of oil. I don't care if it's real estate, or I don't care if it's the widget on the street that somebody wants. Supply and demand still dictate what happens to price. And so what we went through was supply chain shortages that started in COVID. Demand wasn't real high when COVID hit, but as we came out of it, this endemic theme, obviously – Part of what Brian brought up was the government stimulus, but this concept of checks to the individuals, whether it be PPP loans and business owners, or whether it be individuals getting um, you know certain rounds of of stimulus, what that allowed for financially is people to have what we saw in the last nine months, which is increased demand. So when you see increased demand, right, and it decreases supply, prices have to go up, and that's what you're seeing on this chart. That's why we have you know, haven't seen this in 40 years. So yeah, part of it is government stimulus. Part of it is the lack of supply that was built up. But part of this is that there's still really strong demand by the consumer, especially here in the United States, which is why we're still seeing, you know, numbers fairly strong as far as earnings go, because people are still spending money. Sorry, Ryan, go ahead. No, no, that's great. Thank you. And, and so they're kind of where our thoughts are. I mean, there's lots of different opinions out there. We, we agree with Goldman Sachs on this, that although inflationary pressures are unlikely to subside quickly, um, remain confident that by the end of this year, we're going to start to see those numbers slow down. And, and that kind of leads us to the Fed. So part of what's happening right now with the market is kind of pre this Russia Ukraine stuff is that we were talking about raising rates. Because what's the best way to stop inflation historically? It's been to raise interest rates. Again, many of you are a little bit more mature in age than Gabe and I, and you remember the 1980s when we kind of had runaway inflation, we had to raise interest rates to slow it down. And interest rates kind of put a big old brick on top of the US economy and it just slows it down. And, and that's what the Federal Reserve, um, Colin, or not Colin Powell, Fed Chief Powell is talking about right now is just raising rates and so the market, by just even talking about raising rates, has put us into anywhere from a 10 to a 35% correction, depending on which index you're looking at. The S&P is down about 12% from its high, whereas small cap growth in the U.S. is down close to 35% in some parts from its high back in November. And it's all about this idea of raising rates and how it changes future cash flows. And so as we look at the Fed, the Fed has a really, really tough job. If it does nothing, which it's being accused of right now, inflation keeps going and it eventually gets out of control like we saw late 70s, early 80s. So they have to do something and raise rates. But if they raise it too fast, it could also stall us out and put us into a recession. So they've got to thread this needle exactly perfect where they want it. And you're seeing by even talking about it right now, you're watching markets correct. And we haven't even raised rates as of today. Now, within the next two weeks, we expect to see the first rate hike. So I think we do figure this out. I think Powell understands that he has to be very, very sensitive with this. I think we're going to see somewhere between two to 3% on the Fed funds rate, which is kind of the short end of the curve. Um, this would be tied to your car loans, your credit cards. It's not what your, your house mortgage is tied to but it's the short end of the rate. So again, this is kind of what the market was paying attention to before we got into this Russia-Ukraine stuff. Looking at overall sentiment here before I pass it back to Gabe, um, year over year, we're definitely seeing a decline in where just the consumer is when they look towards the overall economy. Again, I think that's being priced into the market right now. There's just a lot of nervous people out there because of inflation. Um, we've had a great run up since COVID. And, and so we're feeling that sentiment right now, but we are starting to see that turn around. We'll talk about that in a second here. Yeah, so thanks for the update on the economy, Ryan. Hopefully that was helpful. Again, looking at economic factors that matter to the financial markets, right? What does this mean for financial markets? Um, you know, stock returns were strong for the year 2021, whether it be the United States, the S&P 500, which that's the highest number. So we put that up there, 28%, whereas international was up 18. You could see bonds, right, provided their diversification, i.e. down one and a half. So for clients that don't like having 40% of your money in fixed income, it doesn't feel very good in 2021. But I'll tell you this year, when I tell a client, hey, we're outperforming the S&P by 7%, they're like, well, that's great. 
we just happen to be down seven and it happens to be down 14. So just remember that there's, you know, the idea of diversification, obviously Russell 2000 and small caps, the difference there between growth and value. So growth outperformed and of course commodities um, did yeah. find themselves. Uh, as only far thing as, I'd um, add, add there, Gabe, is just, again, these are kind of your top looking indices, but when you look at a 60, 40 portfolio last year, kind of the benchmark that a lot of retirees are, are at, we saw anywhere from a five to 8% rate of return. And again, it's because of that big portion of 40% in bonds. And as rates go up, it's really, really tough to make money in bonds. And you saw the US ag, which, which I'd say is the most um, conservative one out there was down one and a half percent last year. US treasuries, like a 30 year US treasury was down as much as 22% last year. So a major, major headwind that we're dealing with right now. Right. And that's why we say, right, stocks are a good diversifier to bonds, just like bonds are a good diversifier to stocks. And what I mean by that is you typically hear, hey, let's own things that diversify from the stock market so we don't have as much volatility. But it's also true. That's what's happening right now. Right. The first two months of this year, bonds have provided a great diversifier. Same thing with commodities. But in a year that fixed income doesn't do very well. Stocks also provide to be a great diversifier to that of, of fixed income. So yeah, yeah, not surprisingly, yeah. energy was the top performer. It had been the worst for the last three straight years. Uh, crude oil today up $7.55 or 7.3% to get us to $110 a barrel. Uh, far cry from the negative $37 a barrel. We saw some yeah. you know, two and a half years ago. Interesting, Ryan and I were batting it around this morning. We we're like, if we could just figure out how to buy oil at the price, right? We would have we bought it at 50 but there's no investment that actually – you just own the price of oil. You, you actually have to take receipt of it, which none of us want a barrel of oil. So at that point, you're using some sort of derivative. Uh, not surprising, though. Energy is the top performer. Um, I thought this was great to see S&P 500 companies profitable. This is why stocks went up, right? Companies made money. I think it's important to note that when we go through the inflationary cycle, Ryan tried to bring this up a little bit, but inflation isn't bad for stocks because it's the companies that are reporting this stuff that are the ones charging the inflation because they're feeling it all the way down their supply chain. So when you think of inflation, typically real estate, commodities, not as much, but better, as well as stocks do well in an inflationary environment. Okay, it's just something that, um, as far as, you know, you hear this argument that, hey, stocks are expensive, even after this 10% decline, we can look at lots of different metrics, uh, PE ratios, and I don't want to bore you with that, but examine on their own, stock valuations are, Expensive, giddy levels, yet they are far more attractive when viewed side by side with bonds. And that's just because, again, when you look at with low yields and rates rising, so we still want to own that portion of fixed income. It's still core to what we do, even if we're going to be down 1%, because that's a really bad year, right? And I, I can handle a really bad year down one. I just don't want a really bad year being down 40, okay? So, again, compared to bonds, uh, you got to remember that stocks still provide long-term value, right? And here's a kind of a, a chart on, on bond yields um, rose and fell. This is back to the 80s. So when we talk about higher inflation, there it was on the chart, right? That's when 10-year cost maturity was at 50% at one point in the early 80s. So we've been in this 40-year long-term trend or what we call a bull market in bond because as rates go down, that's good for the value of the fixed income that we do, you know, there's been conversations for years now. Are we at the inflection point? I think with this amount of inflation we have, its it yields have to rise. Fixed income in a low interest rate environment. Uh, again, I think it's important for you guys to realize this is a little bit uh, specific to client accounts, but the fact is we've done some things in all of your accounts that aren't traditional fixed income, as opposed to saying we're going to go out and buy ABC company total return bond fund. We've have added everything from a market neutral uh, guaranteed income fund to a hedged equity to a multi-strategy fixed income that doesn't just rely. Um, so there's there's ways, whether it's real estate, core plus, hedge strategy, certain things that we're doing um, to try to offset that core conservative portion of our portfolio, but it isn't just so interest rate sensitive. Where we may be going, what's all this mean, right? Ryan tells you about the economy. I tell you about what that meant for financial markets. What do we think going forward? And, you know, interesting, this is just a topic moving forward is this ESG, which is environmental, social, and governance, as well as face-based investing. Ryan was just at a conference, so I'll let him speak to this a little bit, but this is just something to pay attention to. Yeah, yeah, not, not as popular in kind of Montana, North Dakota, Wyoming, South Dakota, but it, it's stuff that we're paying attention to and, it, and we feel a responsibility to just educate you on. 
Um, really going into the Joe Biden election, you had this ESG, I call it kind of going green um, investments and a lot of money piling into those areas. And then something we're also seeing is just faith-based investing. Again, if, if somebody has a Christian belief or whatever that belief may be, where they're trying to invest in those specific areas that they're passionate about. And, and so it's something we're paying attention to. Um, again, back east, this is a really, really big deal the last couple of years. Um, not so much in our area, but but we are keeping our head up and just learning about all this stuff and educating clients as they need it. So again, putting it on your guys' radar. So these are reasons to be optimistic, right? This is what U.S. business leaders said, right? They were going to hire more employees. They were going to increase capital investment. They're going to try to grow sales and obviously benefit from the Infrastructure and Investment Jobs Act. So again, these are signs why we are encouraged uh, what we're looking at when you say the economy is made up of the U.S. government, direct business spending, and the U.S. consumer. Those three things make up 100% of all the goods and services that are produced in this country. When business owners are saying that, that's going to be good for employees, which is going to be good um, you know, long-term for capital investment. So I just think it's important for us to look at what some of the – as we look forward, uh, innovation and creation, right? Whether it's the space race, metaverse – uh, bioscience is 3D printing, industrial technology, AI. I mean, you guys can read drones. I, this stuff, this is that innovation part. This is what's made our economy what it is. We haven't tripled the number of people in the United States in the last 50 years, but we've tripled the size of our economy due to this innovation and creation. So we need to see more of that. Um, what are the risks to this? COVID-19 is there. That's still a very legitimate risk. Labor costs. Ryan brought up higher wages because of inflation. Supply chain issues, which probably are going to stay bad longer than we expected because of the next one, which is Russia and Ukraine. Guys, I'll tell you, it's hard for me personally to talk a lot about. And Ryan, I think maybe the next one even is geopolitical. So if you want to get to that, but uh, China turmoil, they're there, right? We don't know how much they're part of this. Uh, uh, certainly behind the scenes of Russia, we think they are. We're seeing they're always on our radar, right, guys? China is almost always one of the two or three biggest geopolitical risks that could disrupt growth. But as you see there, uh, whether it's technology decoupling the United States and China, that's accelerating, right? That's obviously the supply chain issues of COVID, the little chips that go in cars that we can't get, um, you know, major cyber attacks. I, I even saw something this morning that, that there's, there's uh, you know, Russia wants to, to attack the, the wealth management area. I've yet to see any, any news yet today, but the idea is that cybersecurity tax, Ryan and I own an insurance policy for this that I'd never owned. This was not on my radar five years ago. Uh, we have a lot of stop gaps in place. Um, and then, of course, strategic competition. And as it says there on the bottom, Russia invades Ukraine. What I was going to say earlier is it's a little bit harder for me to talk about this because there's real people that are affected, as in I got to see a video of a dad sending his daughter and wife on a bus out of the country while he stays. I can't imagine what that would feel like. So we're praying for our friends in Ukraine, um, and I'm praying Russia gets whatever it is they want and this stops quickly. So for you to be clear, like I want this to end as fast as anybody. Um, from a purely economic standpoint, I do think Europe is a lot more at risk than the United States because 40%, 41% of their natural gas comes from uh, Russia as well as 25% of their oil. And these are 27 countries that make up the European Union. Um, 3% is Russia's GDP worldwide. Ukraine's is 04 it's not a huge part. I certainly think commodity prices will continue to be on the rise. Natural gas is used to make fertilizers, so we could see a long-term impact there. Wheat prices, there was an article in the Gazette about what's happening wheat prices-wise. So I think it might mean inflation lasts a little bit longer. Uh, it might mean that supply chain issues, I do think from a risk standpoint, the risks of COVID have been diminishing. This is now replacing that risk. So a little bit longer comment there. Yeah, well, All of that to talk problem. about. Go ahead, yeah. Ryan. Yeah, just one comment again, Gabe. Um, we did have Caitlin research this this morning. Do we have any exposure to Russia right now and Russia companies and, and, and all of our funds that are overseas, um, specifically emerging markets and, and just some of those international plays? We, don't, we aren't seeing any. If there is, there's very, very little. And obviously, we, we would be very conscious of not investing in Russia, Russian companies right now. So I know that question's come up from a handful of clients so far. And then the other thing, Gabe, I think that's important. A couple of years ago, we, we talked about this idea of cyber attacks and, and worked with Commonwealth on it. And we said, what happens if Russia attacks us? And, and their comment was, OK, if, if Russia can 
attack our elections and, and get into the CIA, any one business on itself would be foolish to think they could stop the Russian government from attacking them. They said part of the key is to have good plans in place and then to not be a target. And it's always been something that we appreciate about Commonwealth is it isn't the biggest broker dealer out there. Um, we aren't necessarily a huge target like a you know, Goldman Sachs or any of those big, big, big money managers, Wells Fargo. And so do know we pay attention to these things. We're asking the right questions. Um, we back up information. I know Commonwealth has backup centers. So even if for a couple of days there was an attack, like there could be some chaos that happened no matter where you're at, but eventually they would get everything back into the system. And so do know we're asking these questions and trying to get the best answers. You, you know, the, the other option is you take all the money out of your IRA, pay the taxes and put it all in a safe. I would argue there's way more risks in doing something like that than there is understanding that just we're in a global economy, we're in an electronic e-commerce economy, We've got to do our due diligence, and we are doing that to make sure we're always preventing what we can. Yeah, great, great points, right? I do think, yeah, we had Kaylin do some research. We wanted to make sure we didn't have direct exposure to Russia, which we do not. So to tell uh, for, for anybody that if, if we did, it would have been sold. Um, this last part, I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to let Ryan talk a little bit. But for all the conversations we might have around the economy, financial markets, what my crystal ball might be in the future. Um, what matters most is that you have a plan. Part of why we think most of you have engaged us is to help you plan, right? It's in the name of our company, Strategic Retirement Plans. But the idea is that there are some non-natural parts to investing. This chart that he shows here, I wanted this to put in there because this shows the intra-year declines that a market might face. So again, I'm not looking at any specific year, but I could go back to 1983. At one point, the S&P 500 was down 17% that year and finished the year positive plus 15. You go back to 2011, 2012. The S&P at one point was down 12% and finished the year up 13. As recently as two years ago, at one point, the S&P was down 34% in 2020, i.e. the first quarter, we call that COVID, and yet finished year positive plus 16. So I want you to be aware that as you see year to date, that intra year is 12, 12.5%. Um, this is normal market movement. This isn't outside the nine dots. Obviously, the risk of the potential of this war getting dramatically worse, that's out there and that's a concern. But when we look at Historically speaking, over the last 40 plus years, what we're seeing right now in the form of volatility or this decline is, is lack of a better term, par for the course. Yeah, yeah, well said. Yeah, so kind of just ending on this idea of what matters most, we, we take a deep responsibility to make you all better investors. We know you've hired us to do that. Um, but you know, we also have a responsibility. And so this conference I was at last week, there was about 1,900 like-minded advisors. Um, a couple times a year, Gabe and I and Kaylin get to go do this where we learn about, you know, new tax laws coming. We get to meet some of the top economic minds out there, and it just helps us do our job better. But one of the sessions I went to was just on this idea that investing isn't natural. OK, it, it just isn't natural when you look at it. So you have to have a plan. And so we wanted to just review some of the things we've talked about with all of you um, through the years. But, but why that is, main reason being is this idea that the pain of losing money is two times worse than the joy of gaining money. Okay, meaning if we made you 20,000 bucks, yeah, it feels good. But if we lost you 20,000 bucks, it's actually, and they, they read the brain on this, twice, if not sometimes three times worse to lose money than it is for the joy of gaining money. And so that creates bad behavior in us. Okay. And this is all tied into this idea of fight or flight mentality, which usually works for, for humans. But when it comes to investing, it's very, very dangerous because we start following the crowd, meaning when everybody's getting in because, oh, this thing's got to keep going higher and higher, that's about the time it decides to correct. Or when it gets bad and you start to see things just rolling down, you panic and you sell out. And so this whole idea of fight or flight doesn't help us with investors. Remember this, the media exists to create big headlines, um, not to make us better investors. I always tell people, Fox News and CNN are not there to help you make good investment decisions. I promise. They're there to sell ads, usually about gold or silver. And so just know 
that's what media exists for. Okay, now Fox News, our business, and I know there's some of them that are a little bit more geared to the market. There's still some good things there, but don't be fooled. They're not there to make you better investors. Short term, markets act like a voting machine, not a weighing machine, meaning they, they feel this day-to-day -day noise and they are absolutely emotional with it. Meaning just look two or three days ago when Russia and Ukraine stuff, market goes down, then it flies back up. Day to day, it doesn't act like a weighing machine. And what we mean by that is long term, it does look at fundamentals of companies and how economies are doing and all of those really important things that help us make good investment decisions. But it's the day to day where it's a voting machine. We all have what are called investor biases. And there's between eight to 12 of these that are really fascinating to study. Um, Gabe, Kalen, and I are, have all studied them as part of our designations. You know, one of them that I think is always the most fascinating is the idea of hindsight bias. It's where when we look back on the past, we think we knew what the future was going to hold, meaning when oil was at negative 20 bucks a barrel, we all knew it was going to be 110 bucks three years later. But no one does. But when we look back on the past, we actually think we knew what was going to happen. And the way to solve that is to always go, well, if you know that, then tell me what's going to happen next week with Putin. And it usually solves the issue for us that we don't know what the future holds. We have an idea what it might hold. But when we look back, we have this bias that we knew what was going to happen. So there's all these biases we all have. And then just understand that stocks are the most liquid investments in the world, meaning you can't get into a company any, any easier than you can with the U.S. and world stock markets. I can get into Apple and three minutes later, I can get out of it. Okay, when you're selling real estate, when you're smelling, or when you're selling a small, a small business, it takes weeks, if not months, sometimes years to sell it. It's expensive. Whereas when you're dealing with stocks, you can get in and out of them anytime you want. And that creates volatility because when things get scary out there, people can panic and get their investment out. And so this leads to what can make investing not so natural. So the solution. How do we kind of combat this? Foremost, as Gabe said, we have to have a plan. All right, the most important thing is for all of us, especially in retirement, is we have to have a good plan. We've got to get risk right. Okay, everybody loves the green days. No one enjoys the red. I think you guys will find this story cute. I had kind of a new investor, I think in his like 30s. We put his money to work a little bit after COVID and we were up, you know, 15, 20%. And then this last season, he's, you know, he, he saw the red and he came in, he's like, yeah, I don't know what happened, but I really liked it when I was making money, but I, I don't like it when I lose money. And, and I kind of stopped and I went, welcome to planet Earth. Yep, you and 8 billion people all feel the same way. We love the green days. We don't love the red days. It is part of being an investor in stock markets and really any business and, and real estate is you're going to have some red with the green. Our goal is to always utilize that idea that mar markets go up 70% of the time. So we need more green than we need red, but it is part of it. So getting risk right is important so that when that red shows up, it's not so painful that it forces us out. Okay. And, you know, a good, good strategy for how we do that with all of you, we utilize diversification and kind of this idea of a bucket strategy. As we spend hours and hours and hours every quarter with our investment team, 25 plus people look at our portfolios, helping us build the best retirement portfolios for all of you. Meaning we're looking for the right diversification in just about any market we can imagine. Um, we're making sure we have small caps and mid caps and short term bonds and we've got gold and real estate and just all these different things in there. And it's all part of a greater kind of bucket strategy where we have safe money and then we kind of have midterm risk money. And then we've got most of our risk in our stocks, which we look to be kind of our long-term growth engine, but it's also the most volatile. So just know a ton of strategy and time goes into building that. Um, Kaylin and Gabe and I were all on a call with a Fidelity money manager here a couple of weeks ago. He was a PhD, kind of a German guy, had a fun accent. And when he looked at our portfolio with our investment team, he came back to us and, and he said, you guys, I don't ever say this legitimately because we get business by, by not saying this, but he said, you guys have an incredible portfolio. You guys have, have put great diversification in there. You've got exposure to you know big tech companies that have done great, but you've got value. 
And, and so again, not to toot our horn at all, but to bring confidence to all of you that we work our butts off to build the right portfolios for retirees so we can get you through lots and lots of scenarios. Um, Solution-wise, again, we're always talking about withdrawal rates. And, and what I mean by withdrawal rates is, as when we look at the amount of money you take off your portfolio on a monthly or annual basis, that annual number, we like to be between four to 5% tops because long-term we can handle just about any market scenario with that type of withdrawal rate. And so we're always talking with you guys about it so that we can sustain your money, even as it generates income into perpetuity, which means essentially for as long as we need to. Okay, now we know there'll be seasons where we have you know, a higher withdrawal rate and, and we're always prepared for those, but it's that long-term withdrawal rate that we're always working really hard with all of you. And then, Focusing on just long-term trends as investors, not the day-to-day -day noise. There's always going to be noise. There always has been. We would be foolish to think for some reason, all of a sudden in the year 2022, we're going to stop having day-to-day -day world news. And then use our team to keep you guys anchored. I always joke with, with newer prospect clients that they're going to choose us. They're going to hire us to lose money. And they kind of laugh like, yeah, you're kidding. I'm like, well, no, I'm really not. In the sense that when markets go down, that is when you all need us more than anything because that's where bad decisions get made. That's where people get emotional and they bail out of the market and they lock in big losses. That's why we're here to keep you anchored to a bigger plan to focus on the long-term trends. And so use us as you're getting emotional, pick up the phone, email us. We've talked to lots of you over the last few weeks. Um, emotional investing is, is very, very hard. And that's a big part of why you've hired us. And then learn your own biases. Um, I'm, I'm working on that big time right now, just learning kind of what I bring to the table and where I get caught in my own biases. But then keep in mind these, these last things before we close here. We're long-term investors. We're not here to get in and out and in and out of companies. We're trying to find good companies and good trends and then stay the course. It's not about time in the markets. It's about time in the markets. Okay, and this comes from our buddy Warren Buffett. I think he's one of the greatest investors we've had in modern economic history. Um, it, it's very, very hard to time markets. And even if you get one part of it right, meaning it just happened to bail out before it collapses, then you got to figure out when to get back in. And so you got to get two things right over and over and over to be a good timer. It's a really dangerous game to get into. Not once in 1792 has the New York Stock Exchange not come back to set a new high. So in over 230 years, guys, not once has the New York Stock Exchange not, to co not come back. So time is on our side. And then our entire U.S. and world economy is based on stocks. And I just try to tell people this, that you don't understand. The way we invest your money is in some of the biggest and safest companies in the world that if they go down and don't come back, we will be in the greatest world depression we've ever seen, meaning everybody's in trouble. So you just have to have an understanding of modern economics that we're all tied into it. And if these companies, Apple's, Amazon's, Exxon's, all of those companies go down at once and never come back, the whole world's in a really, really bad place. Um, remember, rarely do our emotions guide good investment decisions. And then as Gabe mentioned, on average, there's a multi-year drop of 14% on the S&P 500 intra-year drop, yet over 70% of the time, stocks are positive when you look back over the last 100 years. And then for each of you that we built a plan for you, we're here to help you make good financial decisions. Um, no, we never like down markets. Our job's harder. Our, our pay's tied to it. Everything about it isn't fun for us, but we also know this is when you guys need us most, and so we're here. Um, we've got a plan in place for each of you, and, and we just are so thankful you continue to trust us. Yeah, right. Great job on that. Um, you know, obviously, that's a huge core tenant. As you look back at our agenda, right, we talked about everything from the economy, financial markets, what our view of of the, the world ahead as best we can see. Of course, uh, obviously, pretty cloudy with Russia, Ukraine. But what matters most is that which we can control. And all those things at the end are, are the part that we continue to lean in for each of you. It allows us to hopefully serve you better. I hope you feel like you learned something today. My motivation to do these is one, to just get to see each of you. Obviously, this is better than on a phone call, not as great as in person. But 
Um, I admire each of you for taking the time to, to join us for 45 minutes. Um, if you do have questions, I'm more than happy to have you either raise your hand or ask that might be something that everybody wants to know. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but I can tell you we certainly are doing our best to, to make wise stewardship decisions with the resources you've entrusted us with, and I think that's why at the end what matters most. And this is all at the end to, to, to make sure that we are serving you guys at a high level. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean we get every decision right. But that's our, our, our presentation for the day. Like I said, many of you will see you this summer for a, for a summer one, but are on the road south somewhere. But anybody have a question? Anybody? I see Jill and Mac. You, Jill and Mac, you guys are laughing. You got a question? Oh, there they go. Uh, I do like how Jay has his shirt off down in Mexico just to taunt all of us that are up here in Montana and Wyoming. Thanks, Jay. Yeah, thanks, Jay. You're down there in Mexico. Really appreciate that. Um, if, if, if everybody doesn't oh, have any one, questions, I do. Is there a hand? Mary nope. Lou. Mary, Buck, maybe Mary Buck's Lou. Giving us a thumbs up. Oh, Mary Lou has a question. Hey, Mary Lou, what do you got? Hey, Gabe. This is Mary Lou. But, hey, Mary Lou. Uh, yeah. I'm here with uh, Mike and Mary Lou. Mike's got a question. Perfect. <laughs> oh, oh, great. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, a couple of things, uh, Gabe. Uh, if I understood correctly, you're investing more in, in, in uh, real estate now and some other things. And if so, can you quantify uh, whether or not that has helped or not? Yeah, great question. Great question. Thanks for asking that, uh, Mike. You know, we haven't added anything new since the Russia-Ukraine. We did add Fidelity Advisor Real Estate Income Fund here 18 months ago. And again, that was partly because fixed income rates are so low. Uh, to ask if it's helped, yeah, it's actually outperformed. Uh, it's got a little bit higher volatility or maybe a little higher risk. So it's not quite apples to apples, but what we bought was an income fund. It wasn't actually owning the direct real estate. It was more the investments, uh, the underlying uh, securities, i.e. the debt side, the income side. And it has been helpful because it's a lot less sensitive to interest rate hikes than than your traditional core bond. So great question. We didn't add any new. It's probably somewhere between a 2 to 3% sliver. When we look at those other assets that we own or what we call non-correlated uh, gold, we don't own any outright silver, but mostly uh, GLD gold as well as that Fidelity Advisor real estate. Um, so it has helped. It's not a huge part. It is a hedge. It's not yeah. like we own 10% real estate. And certainly none of the real estate I own in anybody's account is of the Ill illiquid form, what we call a real estate investment trust. We see them all the time. There's still a few that I'm very entertained by, um, but most of those have a big liquidity five to seven year, and we don't own any of that. So hopefully that answers your question, Mike. Thanks for that. Yeah. And, I have another one. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. A, uh, so we might uh, get out of, you know, stop getting oil from Russia. What's your, what's your plan on that? How is it going to affect... Uh, the market and our investments. Yeah, another great question, right? Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I would love to figure out how to just buy oil, right, without having to take receipt of it. Like, hey, when it was at thirty dollars a barrel, I mean, I thought it would have a decent chance of going higher. And of course, you know, yeah, you can own energy stocks, but you know, Exxon Mobil is only up, I don't know, twelve percent since oil is up a hundred percent. So it's not like it's dramatically helped it that much. As far as what I see, right, I know the announcement was all the other oil producing countries outside of Russia went ahead and released 50 million barrels of additional oil a day uh, to basically tell the rest of the world, hey, like we're not going to deal with supply shortages. I had actually just read here, um, I had sent it to Ryan earlier today that in 2020 was the first year that I believe um, the United States was actually a what we can what we could call a net importer or an excuse me a net exporter of petroleum products so you fast you rewind 20 years ago this means a lot uh more to us 20 years in advance we, we've had all these technologies the bakken went off we were able to oversupply it and so we see oil at negative 30 dollars a barrel during trump's administration so we have a heck of a lot more petroleum products today as a country and independently of russia than we ever did i'm more worried about Europe and the fact that 25% of their oil comes from Russia, whereas for us, if we didn't get another Russian barrel of oil, it wouldn't really affect the United States. Now, obviously, oil's up $7.43 a barrel as we speak, so it's not having the impact that announcement I thought it would. Um, and then last but not least, and I think this is really important, Mike, yes, the cost of fuel to drive our cars is going to go up because of what we're seeing. And yes, the cost of commodities in the form of food stuff, whether it's wheat, corn, all that stuff has gone up. 
It's interesting to note, though, if you go back and look at the late 70s and early 80s and look at the percent of all of your budgets, if I said, hey, what was the percent of the average American spent on food and energy 40 years ago? It was almost a 25%. The number is 23%. So 23% of an American's budget was spent on food and energy 40 years ago. Today, that number is just under 12%. So it's cut in half. Why is that important? Yes, cost of oil or cost of gasoline is going up, and yes, food stuff. We've all seen it. We've all experienced it. If you've been to a grocery store or been to a gas station, you've paid for that. But the percent of our budget today that actually goes to those goods is dramatically less, which we're seeing have less impact on consumers' budgets, which is why I could say I believe consumer demand is still high. So a lot of answers to get you an answer, a lot of words to get you an answer, but I tell you – I don't think it's going to have that dramatic of an impact on our clients and their portfolios, at least the price of oil. We do have some energy holdings, so that will help. Um, But I think you'll feel it more in the the day-to-day when you fill up your car with gas for a while. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, any good question. Anybody else have any ones out there? All right, well, go ahead, Ryan, and add what you want to add. Yeah. No, no, just thankful for all of you tuning in. Um, Again, we know lots going on in the world right now. There's uncertainty out there. We're there to talk to all of you. Um, We're talking to to some of the best minds out there in the financial industry from an economic standpoint, just lots of different areas. Um, We'll get through this. Um, It's never fun. Nobody ever knows what the future holds, but we've gotten through a lot as a country. I do think there's still great things happening. We got great plans in place for all of you. So again, just thanks for trusting us. Thanks for carving out an hour to hang out with us.